Welcome to the Tracker Installation and Training Guide for the software setup of your Bonita cameras. First thing we're going to do is look at camera placement and optimize the position so that you have the best coverage of your capture volume. Then we're going to look into making manual camera adjustments and then looking at what's changing within the software to best focus our cameras. Lastly, we'll take a look at different camera settings within Tracker, specifically in the local Vicon system, and then the different properties within each individual camera. When determining where to position your Bonita cameras in your lab space, one of the best things that you can do is lay out markers within your capture volume. And so what we can do now is go from the 3D perspective to our camera view. I already have one of the Bonitas selected, and you can see I've also laid out markers and what I want to be the ideal capture volume. You want to make sure that between all of your cameras that you have in your system, you have adequate coverage of your capture volume. You may need to go and change the position of your cameras. As you can see in this view, we are able to see a lot of the other cameras within our volume. We may want to take that into consideration and change the position if we're, con if we're concerned about height and we're not sure if our subject, when they're standing there and if they have markers on their head, if uh, if we mask those cameras, if that marker will be where the masks are. That may lead you to change the position of your camera. But just uh, switch between your cameras and change the position until you have ideal placement and ideal coverage. Let's take a look at some of the manual adjustments you can make on your Bonita system. First we have our focus, which goes from infinity to in or near, and this enables you to focus objects at different distances depending on how you have your zoom set. Next we have our aperture, which goes from open to close, and open means that you're letting more light into the camera, where C means that there is less light or no light being let into the camera. The last one is zoom, which goes from wide to telephoto, where telephoto means that you are zoomed in closer to your capture volume. So now let's take a look at how you make manual adjustments. Let's start by adjusting the aperture, lightly loosen the screw, and then adjust that setting side to side until you're happy with it. We'll go through what that looks like in the software in a few minutes. When you're settled on a spot, tighten the screw a little bit. The same thing will go for the focus. Lightly loosen the screw, then hold that section and move it left to right till you're happy with your focus setting. Once you are, tighten the screw. The last setting that we have is the zoom. Again, we're going to lightly loosen it and then move that toggle left and right until we're happy with where the position is. Again, we'll look at this next in the software. When focusing your cameras, you're going to want to look and see what's going on in the software. Let's go to camera view. Then select the camera that you want to be focusing. Next item we want to change is grayscale mode. You want to go from grayscale mode auto to grayscale mode all so that we can see all the grayscale data that's coming into our cameras and that will allow us to best focus them. I don't see our cam the, any of the markers I laid out currently so I'm going to make a few small adjustments. There they are. So let's go ahead and zoom on in. What we want is we want to have a bright white center, a gray outline, and we want our markers to be very circular. They look pretty good, but let's just play around with some of the settings. First thing I'm going to do is start playing with the aperture. As you can see, I've started to open the aperture, and the markers get very large, very bright, and lose that gray outline. Now I'm starting to close it. You see the markers get dimmer and go away. So I'm going to put the aperture back, kind of where it was initially. Now let's look and see what happens when we change the focus. 
one extreme, the markers go away, and same with the other extreme. I want you to notice that as you start to go to one of the extremes or the other, the centers of the markers are gray. They're not very circular. You want to find that sweet spot in the center where the markers are bright white, have that gray outline, and look as circular as possible. The circularity is important because it's helping with the centroid fitting. If they're circular, then we will be able to pinpoint the center of that marker more accurately. So I'm just fine tuning and finding the best settings possible for our Bonita. Then what you'll do is you'll just continue with the rest of your cameras repeating the same process. We have positioned and focused our cameras. Let's go ahead and look at some of the properties within the tracker software that you might be interested in making some adjustments to. For this video, I currently have a Bonita and a T-Series connected together because the properties I'm going to go over are applicable to both cameras. So I've gone ahead and selected Local Icon System in our Systems tab. Now let's go down and look at the properties below. The first one is the requested frame rate. The default that we have it set to is 100, and you're going to make adjustments to it according to your studies and what you're looking at. For your T-Series camera, the maximum frame rate before windowing is going to vary with your T-Series that you have. Go ahead and check online for details on that. As for your Bonita, the maximum frame rate before windowing is going to be 250 hertz. Now below that we have our buffer size. If you're recording at a high frequency or if you have a lot of cameras, you can go ahead and bump your buffer size up. It will not hurt. Um, if you are just using Vicon products when recording, everything's connected to your GigaNet or your TrendNet, go ahead and you can bump up your MX buffer reserve and this will mean that your buffer reserve is dedicated to Vicon products. Now let's go ahead, scroll down, and take a look at some of the core processor properties. First we have the marker movement speed. This value ranges from 0 to 10, where 0 is stationary and 10 is a fast moving rigid body. The default value is 5. For cameras recording at 100 Hz, this translates to a marker moving between 1 to 3 meters per second. When you make adjustments to this value, please consider the frequency at which you're recording. For example, we're recording at 100 Hz. So we will increase the marker movement speed for high marker speeds, but we'll decrease it when markers are in close proximity but do not move very much. If you increase your frequency, then the distance the marker moves between each frame will be different than if you are recording at 100 Hz. Keep this in mind when altering the marker movement speed. Now we have minimum cameras per marker. The default value for this is 2, and that means you must have two cameras see a marker at the same time in order for that marker to reconstruct. For systems with many cameras, you might want to bump up this value. We often suggest that you leave the value around 2 or 3, if you set it too high, then you might start losing real markers. On the other hand, if your value is too low, then you might start seeing stray reflections. You'll need to play with this setting in your lab in order to determine an appropriate value. The ray intersection factor setting is a reconstruction algorithm that will be able to form a single reconstruction from the rays of different cameras. This value ranges from 0 to 10, and the default value is 4. High values could cause noise to be created and markers to be reconstructed in incorrect positions since it allows more distance between the camera rays that contribute to the reconstructed marker. On the other hand, values that are too low might lose real markers since the rays need to be closer together to form a reconstruction. The minimum reconstruction separation setting enables unique markers 
not to converge when they appear very near each other in a camera view. You will want to set this value to one and a half the marker size that you're using in your lab. For example, if you're using 14 millimeter markers, you'll want to set this value to 21 millimeters. This will enable two unique markers where the centroids might be less than 21 millimeters apart in a camera view to retain their uniqueness. This setting enables only the most likely unique marker reconstruction to be reported. Now let's look at some of our camera properties. So I'll go ahead and select one of our cameras and then we'll go down to the properties below. Let's start with some of the settings. The first one would be strobe intensity. The strobe intensity controls the amount of light emitted from the strobe unit. This value ranges from zero to one. Lower values mean that marker edges will be less bright and they may be ignored as markers. A higher value means that you'll have a brighter image in the camera view. The next one is gain. The gain is additional amplification of grayscale pixel values. We recommend that you keep the gain at one and don't increase it more than don't increase it more than two. When you if you need to increase the gain, only do so if you're recording at more than 500 hertz or if your markers are far from your camera. Next is our grayscale mode. When you're capturing, go ahead and keep grayscale mode turned to auto. The only one that you would be concerned with other than that is all. And as you remember, when we were focusing, we turn our grayscale mode to all so that we can see the pixel data that's being brought in from the cameras to help us focus and fine tune our cameras. But when you're capturing, keep grayscale mode set to all. Now let's look at some of our centroid fitting properties. The first one is threshold and our default is 0.5. Again, this ranges from zero to one. The threshold controls the level of reflection to be accepted by a camera. With lower values, good markers will appear very bright and this could increase stray reflections. With higher values, dimmer pixels may be ignored. Then we have our minimum circularity ratio. This minimum circularity ratio adjusts the threshold used by cameras for fitting centroids to grayscale blobs. Again, this goes from zero to one. With lower values, non-circular markers may be accepted as actual markers and then reconstructed. With higher values, circles must be full and bright to be accepted. The last one I would like to take a look at is the maximum blob height. And this number is the maximum number of pixels per line that a grayscale blob can contain in a horizontal line. If it exceeds this number, then the MX camera will determine that this blob is not a marker. So you will need to make adjustments to this depending on what kind of camera you're using. If you're using a T160, which has a greater number of pixel resolution, then you may need to increase this value. It will depend upon your focusing. So take a look at this if you are concerned.